I'm David Knowles, and this is Ukraine, the latest. Today, we speak to Telegraph correspondent Colin Freeman, who's been on the ground across the battlefront, visiting Mikhailivka and Druzhivka in the Donbass, and the area behind the front in the south of Ukraine, near Herzog. This hideous and barbaric venture of Vladimir Putin must end in fate. Nobody's going to break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. Every weekday afternoon, we sit down with leading journalists from the Telegraph's London newsroom and our teams reporting on the ground to bring you the latest news and analysis on the war in Ukraine. It's Monday, the 11th of July, day 138. And today, I'm joined by The Telegraph's assistant comment editor, Francis Sternley, and Telegraph correspondent, Colin Freeman. Dom Nichols is away. Before we speak to Colin and Francis, here are the major updates from Ukraine and the world. Russia has opened fire with artillery, multiple rocket launchers and tanks around Ukraine's second largest city, Kharkiv, and shell cities in the east. The death toll from a Russian rocket strike in the eastern town of Hazov Yar in the Donetsk region has reached 26. The biggest single pipeline carrying Russian gas to Germany starts annual maintenance on Monday, with flows expected to stop for 10 days, but there are concerns the shutdown might be extended due to the Ukraine war. Europe fears Russia will extend the planned outage of the Nord Stream 1 pipeline, throwing plans to fill storage for winter into disarray and heightening a gas crisis that has prompted emergency measures from governments and high bills for consumers. The EU's border agency chief has warned of a new migrant crisis as Africa and the Middle East bear the brunt of soaring food prices due to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And finally, Brazilian President Jair Bolsonaro has claimed his government is nearing a deal to buy much cheaper diesel from Moscow in an apparent bid to boost his re-election hopes. Now I'm joined by Francis Sternley in London and Colin Freeman calling from the Donbass. Francis, can I come to you first? There's been a fascinating interview with the Ukrainian defence minister in uh, The Times uh, today. Can you tell us what he said and what does it show us about the the war as it it unfolds? Well, thank you, David, and good afternoon, everybody. Yes, it's a fascinating interview in The Times with Oleksiy Reznikov, um, who is... Uh, essentially, I mean, it's a real uh, goldmine of information, and of course, everything that he's saying should be taken with a with a pinch of salt. Argue, you know, given given that that he has a job to do, which is is putting forward the the, the Ukrainian argument and uh, in the in the, in the strongest possible terms to an international audience, and particularly a British audience. But even so, I think there's there, there's a lot of content here that that, that is definitely worth um, uh, having a discussion about. So. One of the first interesting things that comes out of it is that he claims that they are planning to mass a million strong fighting force equipped with Western weapons to recover its southern territory from Russia. Um, And he goes into details about exactly how they intend to do that. It should be it's worth saying that there has been some concern amongst Western leaders that if the Ukrainian forces attempt to counterattack too quickly, that this would have a negative consequence potentially for the Ukrainians and, uh, and and thus they should wait until they're in a sort of stronger, more better equipped position to do so. But even so, clearly he is putting forward a defiant message and saying that, that, that it is not only possible, but is the intended plan to have have a counterattack um, sooner rather than later. He says that uh, President Zelensky has ordered Ukraine's military to retake occupied coastal areas, which are vital to the country's economy. And I quote, we understand that politically it's very necessary for our country. The president has given the order to the Supreme Military Chief to draw up plans. After that, the general staff are doing their homework and say to achieve this goal, we need X, Y, Z. This is my job. I'm writing letters to counterparts in partner countries. The generals talk about why we need this kind of weaponry and then we get the political decisions. And then he goes into more detail about the relationship with some of his British counterparts, most notably notably Ben Wallace, the British Defence Secretary. Um, saying that he was absolutely critical in helping to shift the approach from providing Soviet equipment to a more NATO standard artillery 
and guided launch rocket systems and high check drones uh, and and sort of talking about how uh, without Wallace's support that would have had a very negative con- consequence for this stage of the war and I quote it was a long process a month and a half but we got a result Ukraine had a Soviet era armed forces with 30 year old weapons we changed this in three months Um, The minister goes on. He says that whilst he's satisfied with the support that Ukraine is receiving from NATO partners, there is still frustration about the pace of deliveries. Quote, we need more quickly to save the lives of our soldiers. Each day we're waiting for howitzers. We can lose 100 soldiers. And he also puts forward a... Uh, I suppose, a a firm line um, on the withdrawals from the cities Severodonetsk and uh, and Lysychansk in the Luhansk region recently, saying that they were tactical losses that were necessary to save lives rather than strategic defeats. Now, as I say, of course, he would say that. But nonetheless, um, he puts forward a defence of why it was felt that that was necessary and that this does not mean a decline in the Ukrainian fortunes, but rather was a strategic strategic withdrawal with the hope that there will in the future be a major counteroffensive against the Russian forces. And finally, he talks about the unification of the democratic world around the issue, how they're united to defeat Russia and saying that the war will ultimately end uh, his ambitions for empire. And in that vein, he he goes into uh, critiquing Putin's alliances and the strength of the alliances with Hungary and Kazakhstan, saying that they're splintering, um, pointing to the Kazakh president's pledge to uphold sanctions on Russia and his refusal to recognise territorial claims, and sort of saying that from their perspective, this is leading to a disintegration of of Russia's traditional allies and that in the long term that they will be ultimately victorious. So a very rich interview in The Times and one that I think obviously is intended for an international and a, and a British audience to keep keep morale high, keep the support of the Ukrainian forces high. But nonetheless, I think revealing about the state of mind in the Ukrainian camp at present. So I'll pause there because um, I think a lot to a lot to digest. But I thought it would be better to give the lay of the land before before we dive in. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much, Francis. That was incredibly comprehensive. Um, Colin, you're on the ground there in Ukraine. Can you tell us a little bit about where you are? And also from this from this interview that Francis has, has relayed to us, how, how much of this are you seeing, this Ukrainian frustration at um, slow weapons delivery, but equally the, the satisfaction of, of using incredibly high tech and advanced weaponry against the Russians and, and this this will for a, for a counterattack in the south? How, how much of this are, are you hearing? Well, just to address the counterattack issue first, uh, we were down in the south last week. I'm now up in the Donbass in the northeast region. Um, Down in the south, we spoke to a number of people who almost, you know, uh, all of them said, yep, we are uh, raring to go on this attack to retake Kherson, but we need the the long-range artillery weapons, um, which is a, a, a refrain we've been hearing um, in Ukraine for the last couple of months now. It's the same up here in the, the Donbass. Um, there is frustration about it, as you can imagine, because for every they, they, there's this constant refrain also of for every day that um, these long-range artillery weapons are not here. That means another 100 Ukrainian lives lost or whatever. Um, uh, as regards this talk of a big push to retake Kherson, I think it's it's going to be some way off. When we were down there last week, everybody we spoke to said the the battlefield at the moment is fairly stagnant or static. Um, that the, the Ukrainians are making a bit of a push, but um, it, it's, it's nothing that significant yet. And if that push is only really going to start once they have extra supplies of high of long range artillery weapons. I don't think it's going to start until August or possibly even September or sometime like that, if indeed it starts at all. And Colin, you were in the town of Mikhailovka. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? What, what was happening there? What was your reporting? Yes, yeah, so we went to a town, um, just to uh, orientate uh, listeners, um, Mikhailovka is a small town outside of a, um, a place called Slovyansk. Slovyansk, you may have heard, is the next town in line for a big Russian assault um, uh, in, in the wake of the Russians taking the town of Severodonetsk, 
which was this um, uh, large city up in uh, the Donbass region um, that took them about seven weeks to take. Um, Mikhailivka is a really just a, a, a town or village, perhaps 20,000 people or so just outside Slavyansk. Like Slavyansk, it's now in the path of the Russian advance. The Russian front lines are maybe 10, 15 miles away. When you go there, you can hear booms of artillery and so on and so forth. Although when we were there, there was nothing actually coming in towards the town, but that has happened a few times in the past. Um, interestingly, um, the locals in the town uh, were talking to us about the, the brief time it spent under separatist control back in 2014. I say the locals, there weren't very many of them around. The place is a ghost town at the moment, but there are a few people living there. Um, so uh, going back to 2014, which was when Ukraine had a pro-Western revolution that overthrew the, ex the previous Kremlin-friendly government, that, that, that happened in Kiev in the West, and then within a month, within weeks uh, or so, uh, that was when Vladimir Putin staged his own kind of uprising uh, in the East, taking Crimea, and also the republics of the, the self declared republics of Donetsk and Luhansk. Um, those are the ones that are still there, that are still in Russian control. But there were other places where there was an attempted. Uh, uprising by separatists where they lasted for about three months or so, such as here in Mikhailivka. They took power for a bit and then the, the Ukrainians then um, retook these places and threw them out. And um, so we were asking the locals what their recollections of that period was in, um, in, in their time under separatist control, three months of it. And bearing in mind that these are towns in, the, in the, the towns that the separatists took were places where they felt they had a degree of popular support, um, uh, where the, you know a number of Russian speakers, maybe 50 percent of the, of, of the population would be Russian speaking. Um, and yet nobody we spoke to really remembered the, the separatists with any great fondness. We spoke to a shopkeeper who said, oh, they, th those guys, they were just drug addicts. They looted my shop all the time and the whole place was was chaos while um, they were here. And then over in Slavyansk, which was also under separatist control for three months, um, there, you know, we, we spoke to people who remember them murdering a local politician, his body turning up, showing marks of, of, of torture, very bad torture. Um, so, yeah, broadly speaking, not much appetite for a return to separatist control, I think it's fair to say. Certainly not amongst the people we spoke to. And I should put a health warning on this. What are the kind of people that speak to us in these places? The people who think that Western journalists are perhaps not not such a bad thing after all. There are a lot of people in these places who do not want to speak to us and sometimes make that quite clear. And you have to guess that they, they are maybe some of the people who might think that, that might, might lean uh, slightly more pro-Russian. That's fascinating. Thank you, Colin. Can we talk a little bit about your visit to Drzhivka? I hope I've pronounced that correctly. If I haven't, I do apologise. Um, tell us a little bit about what about your reporting in the town and also in, in the piece you've written for the Salagraph, which I would recommend everybody listening go, go, goes to read. You, you pose the question, can Russia succeed in taking the rest of the Donbass and at what price to both itself and Ukraine? So if you tell us a little bit about Drzhivka and then will you talk us through your thoughts on that question you pose? Yeah, sure. So Drushkivka, it, it, uh, it's uh, not not just a visit. I'm still here. Um, our hotel is in Drushkivka. Oh, apologies, it's, apologies. <laughs> no, it's, it's, we've been moving around all over the place. Um, the It's a little town just south of Kramatorsk, which again is, without getting too bogged down in the geography, is up near Slavyansk, a little bit further back from the front lines. So considered a little bit safer. Or so we thought until Saturday morning at 5 a.m., when I was rudely awoken by five very loud bangs. Um, the Russians had fired five missiles, not, not bits of artillery, not mortars, but proper big missiles that landed, uh, most of them about a mile away from our hotel, in succession demolishing a supermarket, hitting a cultural centre, and uh, one or two of them just landing in the ground, carving out big... 10 foot deep holes in concrete and ground. So um, uh, fairly serious pieces of kit. What they were targeting, we're not really quite sure. Um, may have just been an effort to try and scare people a bit. But th th this 
common around all the towns in the conflict zone of the Donbass at the moment. It doesn't really matter where you stay. You're always in range of artillery. Um, uh, and, well, what is their next move? Their next move, really, we think, is to try to take Slovyansk and then just gradually, town by town, um, uh, take the rest of the Donbass. But it's a slow process. And as um, we saw in Severodonetsk, the, Donetsk, the first big town they took, it took seven weeks. And while it, it could be seen as uh, you know, a, a loss for the Ukrainians, uh, there are those who say, well, what the Ukrainians did was they, they fought a strategic battle to take the place, uh, to, to, to vend the place, luring the Russians in, getting them involved in street to street combat where the Ukrainians as the defenders held all the aces and basically using these places to stage very, very um, tough contested withdrawals and trying to just e exhaust the Russians. And the, the the analogy I used in the piece was that um, if this carries on and the Russians want to take the whole of the Donbass and, and perhaps even um, go to Kiev as, as well, um, then it's not going to be a sprint to the finish where they gradually gain momentum. It's more going to be a, an exhausting marathon where every step is agony. And it's possible that they, they may well run out of steam at any point. It's equally possible the Ukrainians may run out of steam too. But um, what we guess is that the Russians are currently chucking everything they can at it in terms of artillery. 20,000 artillery shells a day, apparently. That's a lot. They don't have an awful lot much left in the bag or any new tricks up their sleeve, as far as we can see. Whereas the Ukrainians are still waiting on all this new fancy artillery, some of which has come online in the last few weeks and which can be used to target Russian ammunition dumps behind enemy lines and everything. So we might see the battle tilt in the Russians' favour. That is one way of looking at it. There are others who say the Ukrainians are under a lot of pressure. Their, their manpower is running out. They're losing an enormous amount of people. And, the, the, you know, people like me might be just guilty of kind of wishful thinking uh, and, and groupthink amongst the sort of wider community of Western people trying to make sense of what's going on. That There's this <coughs> desire to believe that the Ukrainians are perhaps doing better than they are. Colin, if I could just uh, ask, it's fascinating hearing your your perspective on this. Um, I was noted your your piece from last week, um, and as I say, like I recommend that people read it. Ukrainian forces make the Russians fight for every inch in the Donbass is what it's titled. Um, but in that piece, you, you say um, that more important than than the casualty numbers is each nation's ability to absorb the pain politically and 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 to quote yourself you say quote as much as mu much as ukraine's deaths have caused anguish its population still seems behind the war there have been no protests and few influ influential voices calling for concessions to end the bloodshed um just wanted to get your sense on the ground whether you do still feel that morale is is, is very high or, or do you sense a, a mood shift in what has obviously been a more challenging series of weeks for the ukrainians no, I don't. I, I should preface this again with a health warning. People tell me, I think, what they what, what they think I want to hear or what they want people to think of Ukraine. So I think there's always a bias in terms of people probably telling me a slightly more optimistic picture than they might otherwise present. But I have spoken to some people who've given me a kind of what's an all account of life in the trenches and saying, look, we're not properly trained. We don't really know what we're doing. Our commander doesn't really know what we're doing. He sometimes comes along to us and says, sorry about how bad everything is. Uh, but we don't mind. You know, we're fighting for our country and um, our morale is high and so on and so forth. So if people like that are to be believed, then um, uh, that, that does suggest that things are still going pretty well. I did think when I first started covering this conflict four months ago that by now we might have seen real signs of, of fatigue in Ukraine and perhaps politicians starting to talk about that we need to um, 
we, we need we need to make some sort of agreement with Russia. I don't see that. There's not much talk of that in the newspapers or any of the media here. And it, it could easily happen. You, um, you or you could imagine it could. It, it might quite easily happen, given the that the, 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 there is some latent pro-Russian feeling among some politicians here. And it doesn't seem like they've sensed that their moment is has come yet. So I'm not really sensing an enormous an enormous amount of, uh, of of disaffection with the war amongst the Ukrainians. Nor are there big demonstrations here in favour of ending the war. That is partly because demonstrations are banned at the moment. But I think if there was a real sense that this was becoming unsustainable and the pain was becoming too great people would probably ignore that. People caught round here are quite used to going out and demonstrating when um, pe- when their governments tell them not to. As regards the Russians, well, it's harder to be, it's harder to know because none of the conditions of a democratic society exist there. So you, you, it's difficult to judge the, the what exactly the, the Russian mood is on this. But um, I think at least with the Ukrainians, we, we have some rough idea that things are going OK. With the Russians, you just never you can never really tell when things might start to smolder. You know, how many you, Russian servicemen are coming home with embittered stories of what, a, what a, you know, of how much they're being lied to uh, about the reasons for the war or how badly the Russian army is doing there. It's possible that that kind of stuff could start to in fact, get get round a bit more in Russia, and at, at that point maybe gather steam. Um, but it, it's difficult to say. That's fascinating. And I know one of the questions that we've pondered again and again on this podcast is that as Ukraine has entered a more attritional phase of the war um, for for numerous reasons reasons we've spoken about in the past. The, the great unanswered question is whether Russia or Ukraine favours that situation, which side benefits more from that style of warfare. And I was very interested by um, a quote you have in the article we were just talking about, where um, it's a, you, you, you quote someone who says, I expect Ukraine will become stronger while Russia will become weaker, with the economy in a shambles, sanctions undermining their military capabilities and morale and discipline issues becoming even more severe. Um, do you still think that is the most likely outcome or do you think that that's something that is perhaps overly optimistic it may, it may well be overly optimistic i can only go by what people tell me i don't live in russia i don't speak to russians on a, on a daily basis and even if i did they would not represent the whole of the country but yeah if you look at the way the various forces are, uh, and, and factors are going it, it it's it's easier to draw a conclusion that favours Ukraine rather than one that favours Russia because a, a lot of the problems that Russia is facing, for example, are only really beginning to come online, like you know the impact of sanctions, the difficulties that they're going to have getting replacements for parts and components for precision music, munitions, that the long term effects are, are, you know on their economy, and you know it, it may play out just at the individual level of. Some Russian soldier coming home, um, busy time in the war, um, and arguing with his, you know, uh, then suddenly realizing that he can't go on holiday to Greece or um, Spain or anywhere anywhere else anymore, and thinking like, you know, what what is this? What we fought for, just so that we we now have to holiday in Russia and um, never holiday in Europe again. I, I sometimes think it's those small things that begin to. Uh, to, to to sort of coalesce and and add to a sort of general sense of dissatisfaction, but it, we we really are in the in the realm of guesswork, I'm afraid. Colin, can I ask? You've been travelling around a, a lot in the last couple of weeks um, between the south and that. Now you're in the Donbass. What what are the differences and and similarities between the war in in these areas? Um, it's quite quite clear actually in the south. Um, uh, where, where I was based in Mykolaiv, which is the nearest city to the front lines. Mykolaiv, you get rockets landing most days um, around the city, sometimes accurate, sometimes not. Um, but you don't see an enormous amount of military activity, um, no, certainly not compared to up here. When you come up to the Donbass, you see tanks driving up and down the road, you see um, a lot more military people around. It's it's a much more militarized 
uh, part of the country. It's it's what you imagine a country would look like when they're fighting a war. And just continuing on with some questions about the South, um, one of the really interesting aspects of this conflict has been the presence of foreign military volunteers um, fighting on fighting on both sides. You've got the, the, the Chechens fighting on the Russian side, but also we know that many Westerners have gone to join um, the fight against Russia. You met some of them. Can you tell me? Can you tell us about them? Yes, so we met um, a unit led by a chap called Daniel Burke, who is from Manchester. He's about 35. He's a former um, uh, member of the Parachute Regiment, fought in Afghanistan, then went off to fight in Syria with the Kurdish YPG group um, against ISIS back in 2017 to 2018, I think. Um, uh, he was motivated to do that after the um, uh, the Manchester Arena bombings, which uh, killed 22 people in his in his home city. Um, I think he had thought of going before then, but that was the um, that that was the the eventual trigger. Um, he's been out in Ukraine since I think early March. He was originally planning to um, uh, do some aid work, but uh, I think he decided eventually that he would be more useful as a uh, on on the military side so yeah he's formed his own he's with a, a unit of guys about um eight or nine or a dozen of them um uh, from all over the world and they are fighting on the front lines in uh, in between Mikhailov and Kherson and about 3 weeks ago they released a video um of themselves firing a javelin anti-tank weapon U.S. supplied javelin weapon at a Russian tank somewhere up um, uh, uh, towards Kherson. Um, you don't actually see the um, the javelin missile um, it, destroying the tank. It's not that easy to be a cameraman in these situations, but I'm told that is what happened. Um, he also said, though, that uh, it wasn't just a case of being handed uh, the javelin and told, right, off you go and do it. He had to do a PowerPoint presentation first to impress the Ukrainian commanders that he actually knew what he was talking about, which which sounds bizarre. It sounds like the sort of thing you might do in the office, but actually makes perfect sense. Um, because for a start, the, these javelin missiles, they cost about $250,000 a piece. So people are not handing them out like candy. And uh, I think he, he had to impress the Ukrainian commanders that he could actually read a battlefield properly and had um, uh, factored in all the various different um, uh, risk elements and so on and so forth. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I think that, that they've, they've been down here for about um, a month or so and um, he's planning to stay here for as, as, as long as he can. And, He's one of a number of British volunteers here. I, I, the numbers are hard to estimate. I think maybe uh, 50 or 100 in the south and possibly about the same number in the north. But it, it's it's a lot of them do not speak to media people like me, so it's hard to be certain. If I could just ask, Colin, what's your impression generally of units like his and another, or from what you've heard or read about other such international brigades because they've obviously been a, a quite a significant focus in this war um just sort of do you, do you feel that they are you know the the impressive the real deal um or do you think it's sort of slightly sort of amateur I note that you said in your piece you know it wasn't quite the Hemingway experience they expected for some inter- people who've joined these international brigades some talk of being sent on suicide missions without proper weaponry just sort of wondering what your general impressions were of them well yeah I think when they first when the call first went up in early March a lot of people came out then possibly up to 20,000 um overall um and uh some were put off by the fact that very early on in about mid-March, there was a, a, miss, a Russian missile strike at the training base that was being used to train a lot of the international volunteers, killing at least 35 and possibly up to 100. It was clear that the Russians knew that that base was being used for international volunteers. That frightened a lot of people. Um, as you can imagine, a lot left after that. Um, and then... The other difficulty they've found, though, is that you would expect if you signed up um, at your local Ukrainian embassy in London or France or Washington or wherever uh, to fight, that once you arrived, you'd you'd be pretty um, uh, you'd be uh, if, if life would be made easy for you. Um, you would be perhaps do a bit of basic training and then be 
told where to go and um, given your gun, get on with it. A lot of them said they ended up hanging around for weeks or even months with nothing really much happening, um, being told that they were waiting for vetting, but that not really worked, seeming to get anywhere either. And I think they just got bored. Well, not bored, but felt like, look, if we're going to come out here and risk our lives, we want to get stuck on with it, stuck in with it. And they're not getting paid in the meantime. So after a couple of months, a lot of them just went home. Others who've, who've stuck it out just found it difficult, I think, to actually get any action um they they need to be assigned to a ukrainian frontline unit often that's not easy or that isn't just done automatically so they they have to basically kind of go out and find commanders who will take them under their wing and as you can imagine that's a frustrating experience often they rely on middlemen for introductions to commanders apparently sometimes those middlemen have asked for for money or they've they've introduced them to commanders who are no use or who just have intend on using them as kind of neighborhood watch guys in their local villages. It's not really what they want. I've also been told, well, that, that one of the reasons why some commanders are reluctant to take these people is because they're worried about potential consequences, diplomatic or otherwise, if something goes, if, if one of them comes to grief. Um, uh, you know, just sort of, oh, it, it will cause me problems as their boss or whatever, which is perhaps understandable. So what some of them, like um, Daniel Burke, have done is, is really form their own little units that can kind of function more or less on their own, but they, they I, I think his lot are working alongside a Ukrainian unit. And my impression was that one of the things he has to do is, is basically do his best to maintain good relations with them and prove that they are an asset um, in the first instance and, and not some kind of liability, which I think he seems to have done. Um, just a question from me as well. I mean, you, you cover this in the piece, but I think it'd be good to hear a bit more about it. The... Um... The, the the Daniel, when you interview him, talks about how you know lots of these people might have some military experience. So if, if from a British background, it might mean that they've served in Afghanistan or Iraq. And he he tells you, you know, that let's face it, this this isn't Al Qaeda or IS armed with AK forty sevens. This is the Russians with planes, tanks, and a massive army. That that seems like such a huge shift. Can you tell us more about that? How how do they deal with that? And and I mean, maybe maybe this goes to your point of you know quite a few of them have gone home and it's actually it's an, an incredible thing to do to have to commit for this long. Yes, I mean it's been a frustrating experience for many of them, uh, partly on the because it, it, this is a, this is an artillery war. It's um, so your your chance you can spend months on the front line apparently and not see a Russian. Um, never mind get a pot shot at one. Uh, instead, you're sitting in trenches, getting hit by artillery that sometimes wipes out 50, 50 of your comrades every day. Is that necessarily something you want to sign up for? Um, maybe not. Um, uh, so, yeah, it is tough in that respect. And um, the Ukrainian commanders we've spoken to over time uh, have certainly been at pains to sort of say, look, if, you, if you're not battle hardened already, if you've not got combat experience, this is not the place to come and learn. Um, however, in Daniel's unit, um, there are several people who have not fought before. Um, uh, one guy who's the brother of somebody that he fought with in Syria um, has come out here. I think actually came out here as an aid worker or something or planned to come out as an aid worker. I think perhaps, presumably clearly inspired by his brother's example. Didn't have military experience, but is now um, working with Daniel's unit Um that, you, that that may well surprise a lot of people, given um, what I've just said about the the fact that only this is the, the general consensus that this is just a, uh, a a combat arena for hardened veterans. Daniel's view was, well, um, it's you, you never know whether someone's going to be a good soldier or not. He said he knew people who'd been in the army twenty years and were still rubbish because they just hadn't learned, and that if you learn properly and that you're um, and, and that you're prepared to listen to people who tell you how to do things and you're keen, you can actually um, learn on the job. And uh, that actually also is what a lot of Ukrainians have been having to do because half the people um, manning um, trenches here were, you know, at the beginning of the war, they were um, uh, they were IT um, workers or software designers or, um, or, or, you know, any other manner of civilian professions you care to mention. 
Can I ask quickly, you said that one of Daniel's jobs was to maintain good relations with, with the Ukrainians. Did, did you get a sense of what those relations are? If you've got lots of foreign volunteers, many of whom don't speak Ukrainian. Um, I mean, you, you interviewed him in a cafe. How was, did, did the hosts know who he was? Was, it, was he well received? Um, they, they didn't know who he was. No, he actually makes a point of keeping himself quite low profile, which I think is probably sensible um, while he's out and about um, and not on the front lines. Um, generally speaking, foreign volunteers are, are well received here. I think he's aware, having fought elsewhere um, and, and also having had experience of fitting himself in and making himself useful in, in other people's wars, if you see what I mean, where often the the, the structures are a bit messier um, and things are perhaps a little bit less organised. Um, he, he, I think he knows that in order to, to to make yourself useful here, you've got to be seen to be fitting in. Um, what you don't want to be doing is going off, trying to fight your own, have your own crack at the Russians without letting the Ukrainians know what you're up to. Because you might decide, right, hey, you know, let's go and fire some missiles and let's go and have a go at that Ukrainian tank, at that Russian tank over there, unaware that some Ukrainian commander might have been planning his own operation there, which you've then just spoiled um, uh, or what have you. So I think, that, that, yeah, there's a the general sense of that they, they, they want to fit in and, uh, and do exactly exactly what the Ukrainians want them to do. And that's probably the way to make themselves welcome long term. Just another question from me, Colin, taking a step back from from the international brigades and just looking at the war generally and your experience of, of being there. Just sort of wondering generally what your, I suppose, what you expected going out there, how it may have differed from that and perhaps what we're not seeing in Western coverage. Is there a side to this or something that jumped out at you that you thought, wow, I did not expect that? Well, at the beginning, like everybody else, I thought it was all going to be over in about three days' time. Um, got, I was wrong on that. I was also wrong on the fact that they invaded as well. Um, like most people, I didn't think it was going to happen. Um, one thing we were surprised that hasn't happened is there's been no real as far as we're aware, significant cyber component to the war so far. Um, You know, I'm talking to you on a a perfectly good Wi-Fi network at the moment. I'm in a hotel that's got electricity. Um, uh, There is petrol here and so on. The attacks on infrastructure that we thought might cripple the country, especially things like the internet and uh, mobile phone networks and electronic payment systems, um, all of which are vulnerable in any war and all of which you, you if you're covering wars, you, you turn up um, re- ready with um, alternatives, i.e. You know, sort of cash and satellite phones. None of those things have happened. And um, th- that is a surprise. Um, in terms of um, aspects of the war that we have not really covered, I do think there's probably a risk that we are maybe overplaying the sense of Ukrainians triumphing or doing well in this David and Goliath battle. That's perhaps only understandable. I did read an interesting article a few days ago saying that um, the Ukrainian uh, army is is now, you know, that they, they are suffering very very heavy losses and uh, they are beginning to suffer recruitment issues apparently. Um, and when you read that, you do begin to think, well, how much longer can they sustain this? On the other hand, I, I've not noticed among, uh, certainly from the, the fixer I work with or any of his friends, I've not really heard of anybody being drafted in yet, conscription um, of anybody who's not, um, or the, the guys you know, in their early 20s or whatever who don't have any military experience, they're all eligible or liable for draft. But at the moment, they, they, most of them are not being told, you've got to come and serve. And one, one guy told me that his, he went to his local draft office and the commander said to, he, he said to him, have you, got any, have you got any military experience? He said, no, I'm a college kid. Commander said, fine, um, we'll, we'll, we'll put you down, but you're not going to be on the list for a while. We've got several, I think, three previous waves of recruitment first before we come to you and by the way, if we do come to you, then that's a really, really bad sign. That's the that's the point at which the country is really, really in trouble. Um, and to my knowledge, that commander has is, uh, is not given that guy the call yet. That's fascinating. Uh, one of the things that we often hear from uh, Russia sympathisers, indeed we 
get direct messages from people like this all the time um, saying things like, you know, that the, the, parroting the, the Russian line that Ukraine is actually this sort of far right um, enterprise that the people, it's all a facade that we're seeing this sort of cry for democracy and liberalism, that it's that it's actually uh, fake and that it's being used in order to, to get Western support um, and it's all manipulation and that actually there are far, there's far more sort of behavior taking place in Ukraine uh, and by Ukrainians that, that, that that's you know uh, <laughs> echoing what Putin see, said around them being sort of drug addled Nazis and things like that I mean it sounds utterly ludicrous to us from what we've reported so far but I just wanted to you know you're on the ground have you seen any any uh, drug addled Nazis or is this actually just you know the complete propaganda that that we've that we've reported it to be and 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 have expected it to be um in a word no um, I haven't seen anybody even uh, like th- there is a boo- a general booze ban around the country for a start. I've not seen anybody smoking drugs or, you know, noticed any telltale smells or anything like that. And the booze ban is generally fairly well observed. Um, as for Nazis, no, I haven't really met any of them either. Um, there has been this whole debate about groups like the Azov Regiment, um, who I think it's certainly fair to say did have some people who had Nazi sympathies back uh, when the the regiment started um, nearly 10 years ago. Uh, And and that that has been a subject that has been much discussed in the West and um, uh, probably not much more I can say about that. One thing I would point out, though, is that Ukraine, rather like the Baltics, uh, the Baltic republics, unfortunately had the wartime experience of having not one but two totalitarian systems fighting for control over it, um, the Nazis and um, the Soviet Union. And there were times when um, people in the Baltics and people in Ukraine fought on the side of the Nazis. And I think sometimes there's an element of my enemy's enemy being my friend there. And um, uh, to some extent, I think the embrace of Nazi ideology or or certainly emblemology um, in this part of the world may possibly something more have something more to do with a sort of up yours to Russia than um, any really enthusiastic embrace of what Nazism generally means. But that that is just my general kind of uh, hunch on it, and there are other people who probably know much more than I do about it. Yes, as we've talked about on this podcast in the past, just because you have a handful of people who uh, share those kind of sympathies doesn't mean that it can be used as representative of, of a whole country and a whole people. And yet that's exactly what Putin's propaganda machine has has sought to do. But it's fascinating to hear your perspective and, and hopefully the uh, Putin apologists who, uh, who are listening to this can, uh, um, could, could take your comments on board. Well, thank you very much, Francis, and thank you, Colin. I think we're probably coming to the end of our, our time together. Colin, is there anything you'd, you'd like to mention that we, ha- that we haven't spoken about? Um, no, I suppose the only other thing I might, might be of interest is the fact that up in the Donbass, you do notice a, a, a you, you come across a slightly different kind of um, Ukrainian. Um, we are now in we here in the Donbass. You're in an area that um, was populated by large numbers of Russians during the p- p- period of industrialization um, over the past uh, the previous century. So you do get people who have got much more neutral opinions, shall we say, on the war. And um, uh, how do they express them? Well, what you tend to notice is you you, you don't. Very few people around here will say to me, yep, I think Vladimir Putin is a great guy and I hate Ukrainians or anything like that, um, which is perhaps understandable because they're, they're a bit scared. But what you do get is a much more nuanced opinion. You tend to get people saying, oh, yeah, I, I just want peace. You know, I want the warring sides to resolve their differences. Um, and then you also get a bit of kind of... Um, uh, what about is a bit you you hear about well you know um i think it may have been america that all started all this war um with iraq and so on i've heard comparisons between um britain and ireland um and um uh well in which i think the uh um britain was the villain um of the peace and ireland was kind of being compared to russia 
Um, it's rather complicated, but um, the, uh, the, 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 the this was a, a war against you know a, a, a patriotic war to remove a kind of um, a, an unpleasant imperialistic force that that unpleasant imperialistic force being Ukraine stroke Britain. Um, when that comparison was made by somebody, um, I was standing in a uh, in a playground somewhere near near to where a, bo- a bomb had hit. And somebody else then jumped in and had a go at the person who was sort of basically, I think, making what appeared to be some sort of pro-Russian analogy and said, don't start talking that kind of nonsense. It's got nothing to do with Britain and Ireland or whatever. These are the Russians and they're bombing us. So you can see that there was there was quite a lot of um, uh, differences of opinion here. But it, that, that is the way the, ambigu- the, the, the pro-Russian sentiment, if that's what it is, gets expressed here. It's in a kind of just a sort of ambiguity about what is going on really and um I, although i think if if there was a sense that the russians were actually really gaining ground here that ambiguity might become a bit more explicit in in favor of um, the russians well thank you very much colin for that thank you for all your reporting and for telling us and our listeners about it um i'd just like to ask francis and colin and maybe francis go first what should our listeners be paying attention to in the next week what what are your final thoughts and then colin in in, in your final thoughts just give us a sense of uh, where, you'll, where you'll be, what you'll be doing uh, in the next week. Well, thank you, David. I mean, I think just my final thought would be this central question, which we've covered today, but which will be, I think, the defining one for this next phase of the war, which is how does Ukraine straddle what is obviously a necessary military recovery after a very intense few months fighting and successful fighting uh, without sacrificing the sense that the war is still going its way, that momentum is still with them. In an attritional war, how does Ukraine keep the sense that victory for it is still inevitable? Because that will obviously remain critical for the support that it garners from the Western world and also the strength, the resolve of, of, of Western countries when dealing with Russia around energy, which all suggestions are, is about to get a lot more serious, particularly in Germany, where they may even be rationing energy um, within the end, before the end of the month. So um, I think that is the challenge for Ukraine. It seems, based on the interview that I covered at the beginning, one that they are sensitive to, um, but uh, no doubt we'll be uh, following this much more in, in the week and weeks ahead. And Colin, would you like the, the final words, please? Yeah, we may be heading down from the Donbass to a place called Zaporizhzhia, which is where um, close, about the nearest major city you can get at the moment to Kherson, um, which is the Russian occupied city. Uh, there's been talk uh, over the weekend of the Ukrainian army trying to launch uh, uh, an, op- uh, uh, you know, a, an operation to try and retake Kherson, which we discussed earlier in the programme. So that's what we'll be trying to look at this uh, um, this weekend, possibly. Um, otherwise, just to go back to what Francis was saying about um, uh, you know how long the Ukrainians can keep going, and we, we were addressing that earlier in the programme as well. We do talk about exhaustion and both sides um, suffering enormous losses and whether morale can keep going. But I think, generally speaking, the Ukrainians have had an enormous morale boost simply by getting this far, um, you know, by doing what everybody thought they could not do. They're, they're four months into the war and it looks like they're possibly winning it, whereas everybody thought they would be three days into the war and defeated. That gives a country an, an immense boost and probably makes things possible that might or not otherwise have been possible. Um, and, it, you know, I guess the, the comparison is Britain after World War II was, you know, it, it meant uh, it gave the country a huge morale boost um, that lasted for many, many years. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if the same is the case in, is, is the case in Ukraine. Ukraine The Latest is an original podcast from The Telegraph. To stay on top of all of our Ukraine news, analysis and dispatches from the ground, subscribe to The Telegraph. You can get your first 30 days completely free at telegraph.co.uk forward slash audio. You can listen to this conversation live at 1pm each weekday on Twitter Spaces. Follow The Telegraph on Twitter so you don't miss it. If you enjoyed this podcast, please consider following Ukraine The Latest on your preferred podcast app and leave a review as it helps others find the show. You can also get in touch directly with us by emailing podcasts at telegraph.co.uk. We do read every message. 
Ukraine The Latest is produced by Louisa Wells and Giles Gear. And today on Twitter, Gemma Farrell. <laughs>